All right, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Hudson Institute. As some of you know, Hudson Institute uh, is very much devoted to constructive engagement with the world, and that includes both our country, the United States, and the rest of the world. Um, this morning, we are very honored to have Ilya Zaslavsky and to present this paper, uh, which has been a long time in the making. This, the first draft uh, came about about a year ago. And um, while it, it was a little frustrating in terms of how long it took to finally get this out, the timing could not be more impeccable. So in fact, if we had launched this a year ago, I think it, there might have been a whimper of interest. Given what's been going on in the world, uh, I think this is unbelievably powerful and relevant, and it may well be the most important thing that the Kleptocracy Initiative has yet published. We'll see. Uh, there's a great deal of interest uh, in these subjects on the Hill, as many of you may know. And um, so we're very pleased to, to, to have Ilya here. I just want to say a very quick word about the Kleptocracy Initiative and the context into which this fits. Um, one, uh, well, the main, the main uh, premise that we started with three and a half years ago and that remains uh, is the uh, threat of authoritarian regimes. So we're not so much concerned about kleptocracy, but about the growth of authoritarianism. And it just so happens, lo and behold, that all the authoritarian regimes that have been growing in strength and that pose a uh, extremely grave national security threat to our country and to other liberal democracies are all structured along the business model of kleptocracy. And it's, they're all based on elites. In some cases, it's one person in his family. In some cases, it's a network of people who loot their own country and then store their loot in the West. We are the enablers and the safekeepers, we provide the asset protection for modern authoritarianism. This is something that needs to change. Welcome, Ilya Zaslavsky. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thanks for making it. Yeah, uh, it's a big honor uh, to talk uh, at Hudson. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful uh, to Cryptocracy Initiative, Charles. Uh, Davidson and uh, Nate Sibley in particular for preparation of this paper and to Free Russia Foundation uh, with Natalia Arno who uh, gave me a research hat to, to do this uh, uh, report um, as well. Uh, we, and uh, as uh, Charles rightly said, uh, this is not uh, um, a, a paper of, uh, to uh, respond to immediate events. Uh, we've actually been warning about kleptocratic influences coming from post-Soviet space uh, for years. Uh, and uh, there have been a great area of uh, specialists and experts uh, from early 2000s uh, uh, to, to mid-2000s. To, uh, to, uh, that's when I picked up this topic around 2010 uh, from people like Lili Shevtsova, Karen Dewish, uh, David uh, Satter, and so forth. Uh, David Kramer, who will be... Uh, on our panel uh, later. Um, and uh, really, the uh, main point of this um, paper, uh, which consists of two parts, is to present the broader context and nature and uh, norms and practices that post Soviet elites uh, uh, employ in their uh, political and economic activity in their home countries. That's uh, part uh, one of the uh, paper. And uh, then part two looks at how they export these uh, business practices, uh, norms, values, not, not only uh, outright criminality, but uh, uh, what I call corrosive uh, norms and practices. So something which may not be illegal, but still uh, uh, morally questionable or controversial. How they export those, uh, not only money uh, and uh, uh, vested interests, but uh, their own, uh, I, would, I would say, political and uh, economic values and, and practices to the West. And um, 
th this whole uh, report was actually brilliantly summarized in two charts. So uh, on page seven, uh, there is, uh, if, you, if you got a copy, uh, we'll look at, um, at how what we, what we call the, the elites were uh, in post-Soviet space were forged um, through the experience of Soviet legacy. And uh, while the, here we talk about uh, uh, former USSR, uh, th that's the main focus, uh, it's really applicable to, in many respects, to China and Eastern Europe as well. So everywhere where communism was, I think this is applicable to some degree. So just to summarize very quickly, uh, we believe that uh, uh, experience of uh, communism, especially in, uh, f through gulag uh, syst uh, pr system of prisons, uh, made a lasting impact on uh, post uh, on so uh, Soviet societies. That's where uh, norms and practices of Communist Party, law enforcement, and especially KGB, and organized crime forged together. And these were three different worlds, uh, somewhat antagonistic to each other during Soviet times. But then, in post-Soviet times, especially in countries like uh, Russia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, which experienced amazing inflow of uh, petrodollars, uh, these three worlds sort of uh, found peace with each other and uh, fused and merged into uh, one new elite with, uh, essentially, I would argue they took the worst from each of the three worlds uh, and uh, fused it uh, to uh, a new unprecedented level of cohesion and uh, hierarchy. Um, and uh, one of the uh, best examples uh, of that fusion of these three worlds and then employment of it in actual practical terms in, in business sphere uh, was uh, Putin's circle in St. Petersburg uh, uh, in 1990s, where he was a deputy mayor, but he, uh, he at Hudson, we have uh, uh, previously presented uh, uh, papers and films about this. Uh, 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 there were brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, insights into this by Karen DeWish's uh, book, uh, Putin's Cryptocracy, Anastasia Kirilenko's film, uh, who is Mr. Putin, David Setter's uh, insights, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, they, uh, in my view, in, uh, they, w what happened is uh, Putin used KGB circles, Communist Party money, and organized crime in St. Petersburg to uh, extract money from uh, monopolization of uh, different uh, uh, business spheres in St. Petersburg, uh, energy market, uh, uh, supply of... Uh, food expert of uh, precious metals, and then moved money uh, to uh, offshore accounts uh, or to uh, uh, accounts uh, in other um, uh, Western jurisdictions. And uh, they already uh, got a taste of uh, that uh, kind of uh, um, f fusion of the best of two worlds for, for themselves uh, already in that time. And so <clears throat> by... Uh, 2000s, when Putin came to power, he already had a team of people who had experienced this, who enjoyed uh, these uh, practices, and uh, they took it, they replicated it on the level of uh, whole of Russia. And then gradually, I, th I argue, they, uh, used, yeah, they spread it across post-Soviet space and then started to export uh, abroad to the West. And... Uh, I want to, uh, later in Q&A, I want to touch more upon uh, uh, particular nuances of this uh, to, to say that there are, there, I argue there have never been proper liberals in Russian government, especially under Putin, and this is a common myth uh, um, somehow in some of the policy-making circles here in Washington. Uh, but uh, to uh, move away uh, to the second part um, of the paper. Uh, on page 25, there is a second chart, which also, in a way, summarizes um, a lot that w what we want to say. So uh, there, there, the, there is some continuation of uh, practices from Soviet times, and there is something new, qualitatively new. So what's, uh, what's, uh, what hasn't changed much? Uh, 
at the state level, both uh, USSR and Russia are doing similar things. They're using block voting at UN. They uh, uh, use uh, um, uh, they manipulate international organi other international organizations. They use sports. So at state level, Russia is only maybe advancing uh, on a qualitatively new uh, level uh, in digital sphere. But what's definitely much more different and dangerous for the West is the employment of and the ability for Putin and people and also for other kleptocratic regimes like uh, uh, Aliyev's regime, uh, Nazarbayev's regime, is to employ um, corporations and the rich individuals, uh, especially oligarchs, but not only. So the employment of corporate and individual level in the West uh, is uh, is what I argue is a qualitatively new uh, development, uh, in, in, in especially in, since 2000. And that's why uh, we talk a lot about non-state actors. Uh, and um, the, the problem is that um, it, it's very difficult now for Western policymakers to distinguish between a private businessman private individuals, uh, supposedly independent corporations coming from post-Soviet space and state-controlled uh, entities or state-controlled uh, operatives, oligarchs, uh, because there is really no proper uh, distinction between um, public and private uh, property in those countries. Uh, there is, uh, the lines are blurred uh, in political economic senses, and there is no proper market economy. Uh, so, uh, when necessary and when uh, politically expedient, uh, these regimes can pretend to not to, to have anything to do with with operations of particular oligarchs in the West uh, or other non-state actors. But still, those actions could be very useful uh, and politically expedient for for the regimes itself. So, uh, we present some of the examples in the paper. Uh, talking about um, uh, uh, how these uh, people can, these rich individuals, how they can buy influence or impact political discourse uh, or uh, uh, not only uh, launder their own reputation and their money, but also uh, get leverages uh, uh, in politics in the West. Um, and uh, uh, I'm very glad that... Uh, 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 Sarah Chase will be part of this discussion because he, she has been studying these networks uh, of uh, oligarchs uh, uh, for, for, for years now. And uh, it seems like there is now great attention to this with U.S. sanctions, uh, with recent uh, uh, U.S. sanctions who now state that the uh, State Department should look at uh, uh, oligarchs and networks and uh, as they call parastate um, entities from post-Soviet space. Um, so uh, this is very timely, but uh, uh, there are many, uh, many different approaches. And uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, that, broadly speaking, we need to uh, think about a uh, new uh, strategy of containment of cryptocracies uh, coming from post-Soviet space in particular, and uh, so I'm very glad that uh, David Kramer will be talking. Uh, just last week, I got his book uh, about this, uh, and maybe we'll touch upon this uh, during his presentation and, and Q&A. And um, I'll stop at that. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeff Gedman. I'm a former president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and, and other things. And I have the, uh, the, the honor of being the glue between Ilya's fine presentation and a panel of real experts. I'm not a real expert on this subject, but uh, I have no shortage of opinions. And uh, so I've been invited to uh, by Charles, and thank you, Charles, and thank the Kleptocracy Initiative, and and Nate and, and your team for this event today, and Hudson, of course, for hosting. Uh, I have a very brief observations. I read your paper twice. I read it a week or so ago, and then I read it last night. 
and I think it's an important and substantial piece of work, Ilya. And, and as Charles said, uh, arguably more important than ever because of everything that's going on in the world, so more about that in just a moment. The, the way I read uh, Ilya's paper, it, it's important for three different reasons. Uh, so I'm not sticking to his chapter titles, I'm skipping, uh, sticking to the way I read it and understood it. One, it, it, to this topic, how non-state actors export klepto kleptocratic norms to the West, it's a very nice, well-written, and relatively succinct exposition of how we got here. And I do think history is important, you know, like everything in this life, including the Trump Hotel and Donald Trump, these things don't come from nowhere, actually. They have roots and they reflect something. And I think uh, that helps me and helps us a lot. S second of all, as a bit of a sidebar, but you alluded to it and it's very important, you've given us some information and some analysis and some of your judgment about how the Putin inner circle works on these matters. And I think anything that sheds light on that and deepens our knowledge and understanding is useful. Uh, you said that you take exception to the idea, Ilya, in some Western circles about insider liberals in the Kremlin. And uh, to, to my mind, you're right. It's a disease we just can't overcome. We, at least we Americans, everything has to be binary. If there's a bad guy, there must be a good guy, <laughs> you know? So Putin is a designated bad guy. So anyone we think maybe smells a little bit different must be on our side. And, and we're not very good, I think. We, I'm saying this as a proud American who spent 12 of the 15, last 15 years abroad. We're not always very good about gray or navigating ambiguity, okay? So you bring that to our attention. So number one, how we got here. Number two, I'll, I'll call it the nature of the beast. And, and then number three, um, how this export of kleptocracy has to do with both a system, but also a culture. And the system, I think, is arguably easier to understand and describe than the culture, the habits, the values, the behaviors, the unwritten understandings and contracts between individuals and groups. And that comes to what you uh, assert, and I think rightfully so, is conceivably the biggest damage that we incur uh, in the West and in countries like the United States. Uh, because of what? Because of our negligence, because of our naivete, because of our ignorance, because of our greed, we are fantastic accomplices. <laughs> we are just fantastic Accomplice, accomplices, which is part of the great tragedy and danger in all this. Which brings me to my concluding thought, uh, and Charles's opening remarks about with all that's happening in the world. Well, th this kind of work that you've done and what the Kleptocracy Initiative does, in my view, is so vitally important because one might approach it and think, isn't that interesting? It's a think tank niche, and it's really quite fascinating. But if you've noticed, when did it happen? The last five years, seven years, 10 years, 12 years, 15, 16, 17 years? If you want to put a date on it, maybe the, the, the rise of Putin and Putinism in 1999, 2000. We have a pattern now where authoritarians around the world, including in Russia, act with alarming self-confidence. Even when objectively they have weak hands to play, they know how to play them very, very well, okay? And democracies, we democracies, you can fill in the blank. We're, we're slipping, we're sliding, we're uncertain. Uh, we have things that are broken that are not so simple to fix, that transcend, in my view, partisan boundaries and are not just unique to the United States or Britain or pick a country in Europe or across the West. And I think, you know, back to your paper and to complete uh, my thoughts, Ilya, you can put these things in two different kinds of baskets. One is vitally important, which is what, what the bigwigs, the fat cats, you know, the oligarchs, uh, fixing laws and fixing regulations. So I said, I think that's vitally, vitally important and central. 
But the other part, and it does come up in your paper, is arguably the harder and maybe even in the longer term the danger, more dangerous part, and that's back to culture. Theirs and ours, okay? So, so theirs has a history rooted in habits and values and behaviors that, that we deem pernicious and, and mischievous, if not outright, in many cases, nefarious. But for us to participate and enable as individuals, as institutions, as a society, we have to check our own values, too, and our own judgments, too, in all sorts of small ways to complete, to anecdotes, if you will. One is, um, we know a lot, I think, about how authoritarian regimes work. I think we know something about how, in transition, countries become democracies. I think we know actually less about how stable democracies remain democracies. There's this implicit notion that once you've crossed the finish line, you're done. Oh, we're a democracy. You're the United States. We have these strong institutions. We're done. By my estimation, you're never done. <laughs> Ever, 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 ever. Let me tell you what we know about authoritarian regimes. In East Germany, after the regime collapsed, fall of the wall, 1989, there's an interview with a Stasi, East German secret policeman, where the interviewer was asking him how the Stasi worked and how they controlled the Politburo and the full apparatus, the secret police. And he laughed and he said, well, yes. But you know, it was all, he used an expression, he said, it was all the ordinary citizens we got complicit. He said, those were the little rote lampen, the little red lanterns that really kept our empire alive. It's kind of chilling, you know. All the individuals who for a thousand reasons, rationalizing, minimizing, apologizing, made it work. Do you recall, some of you do, the uh, 1978 essay by Václav Havel about the green grocer in Prague? and how the greengrocer, you're nodding your head, puts out a sign every day that says, Worker, uh, workers of the world unite. He doesn't believe in it. The others don't believe in it, but it's part of the get along, go along culture. If you don't do it, you get in trouble. If you do, it makes for harmonious relations. Well, where do, where, where do I leave us, Ilya? Part of your paper is figuring out how to block and contain and combat them, the kleptocrats from abroad, but I think we should be much, much more self-aware about what we do and how we do it here. My favorite part of your paper, you only wrote two paragraphs, and that is page 31, co-opting influencers and celebrities, where you have a former German chancellor in the first line. That should be the subject of your next paper. Anyway, thank you and looking forward to the panel and discussion. <laughs> yes. So it has a dead battery. <laughs> ah. <laughs> The battery is no longer dead. Can I be heard? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, well, uh, thank you for these brilliant remarks, Jeff. Um, and I should say that uh, the initial draft of this paper had a lot of names and details in it. And page 31 was a lot longer a year ago. Uh, so uh, there are plenty of... Uh, uh, Plenty of examples of this, and I guess uh, uh, Gerard Schroeder is mentioned, and he's certainly the, the most famous example of this phenomenon in his recent uh, joining of the board of um, what's the, uh, Rosneft. Thank you. Rosneft is kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting also that the Chinese bought 
19% of Rosneft for I think $5.4 billion. So maybe we're kind of back to the 1990s on, on some level. Uh, but anyway, welcome, uh, welcome Louise. Oh, thank you. And welcome to your interactions with the kleptocracy initiative more generally. So would you, uh, so Louise will speak for a few minutes, give her take on this, and then we'll have a, a brief conversation with us and uh, move on to the next part of the program, which will be David Kramer. <coughs> I found the paper very interesting, and there's one part that I think, maybe it's your next paper, that needs a little bit more attention, which is what I refer to the phenomenon of corporate raiding. You've talked about stealing of intellectual property, but I think corporate raiding, which is where one group of oligarchs that have political power take over the business of another oligarch. They may not all be oligarchs, they may be wealthy businessmen, but they use organized crime and they use the Russian legal process and they use corruption to take over businesses. But what's significant about this corporate raiding is how it is being exported to the West. And not the phenomenon of corporate raiding, but many of the elements around corporate rating are having a very pernicious impact on our top, some of our top corporate law firms and also on our judiciary process. And one of the things that I don't think in all this media exposés of the last few months that has gotten enough attention is what went on with the Prevazon case, that's the Magnitsky money, before that case was, was, shut, was, was settled um, in the middle of May before it went to trial. And for those of you who don't know, um, the Prevazon case concerned the movement of money into New York real estate, um, allegedly by Mr. Kotsif, uh, this who is linked to very high-level Russian officials, and some of the money was related to um, the Magnitsky case. And this case was settled. Now, this case was in process for two and a half years. And the reason that it was is that the first set of lawyers, the American lawyers, who were involved in dealing with this corporate raid were thrown out by an appellate court of the United States. And if you read this 60-page opinion, it is very disturbing of how the illicit behavior of this company, I mean, they're not criminally charged, but their immoral behavior, their conflicts of interest, how they used insider information as being the lawyers first um, for Mr. Browder, then to use against Mr. Browder, because they worked for both opposing sides, and use their insider information to try and defend their new clients, is a very rare occurrence in American law. And this case shows how corrosive this is on our legal system. It took enormous resources of our legal system to, to challenge the lawyers, and how expensive it is to fight off this corrosive impact on our legal system. This is just one example. I have participated and heard testimony in other corporate rating cases that are going on in, in the US in which top American law firms are doing things that are corrupt and possibly criminal in very, very disturbing ways. And I think in your charts, you're, you're not mentioning enough about the role of lawyers and attempts to undermine our judicial process. And I think that's worthy of a lot more attention because this case that's documented in a 60-page appellate opinion lays it out. But there are many more examples to be found with some of our most prestigious law firms. This is not random. These are not rogue lawyers. These are the core of our legal establishment. 
Secondly, this corporate raiding, the, the proceeds of it are, are laundered into the West, but they also have other consequences for us. Because it is so difficult to be a legitimate entrepreneur, it's hard to start a business in Russia, it's hard to maintain a business and not be raided by somebody who is corrupt and, and allied to the oligarchs, people are not starting businesses, and they're especially not starting businesses in the sectors in which Russia has the most capacity, which is the tech sector. And lately, in the last few weeks, we've been having enormous revelations about Kaspersky, which is started as a, a tech company, but is not really an independent tech company. And I think that part of why we see so much rogue activity in the high-tech sector that is influencing our elections is in part a consequence of this oligarchical behavior of corporate rate. And so there are two ways that this pernicious corporate rating is affecting us. It's affecting our law firms, it's affecting our judicial process, and it's affecting our, um, our media as there is no, as we're having an over-criminalization. I mean, there's always, we have criminals like Dread Pirate Roberts who have, or techies who've become criminals, but we have a disproportionate problem in Russia because of this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Louise. Um, Ilya, would you like to respond to uh, Louise and, and Jeff, perhaps, before we go on? I, I completely agree with what Louise said, and uh, I actually expect uh, this chart that we have on, 20, uh, on page 25 to grow more from a circle into a pair, because, <laughs> because this uh, oligarchic uh, and individual level w is just growing exponentially as we... Every year, uh, we ha I have counted so far around 30 to 40 different layers of uh, distinguishable uh, expert of corruption but, uh, or co corrosive practices, but they will learn about new different ways of uh, very sophisticated corruption, which Jeff uh, mentioned, uh, that they have uh, may maybe fewer resources than Western companies, but they employ them so much better. Uh, and uh, yes, it's not only about uh, law firms, but it's about public relations firms. It's getting into the media and enforcing some sort of self-censorship on it, uh, uh, using uh, due diligence companies uh, in all sorts of areas, uh, from businesses to universities to even think tanks, uh, to, uh, re uh, to uh, m launder their own reputations, uh, their money, but then take uh, that money uh, uh, into all sorts of um, activities in the West, so beyond real estate or just uh, yachts or luxury assets. They, they really uh, get these um, supposedly non-state actors get more and more confident, uh, and they want now higher and higher prizes for themselves and the acceptances uh, uh, in the West uh, to enjoy the, the, the same sort of political impact and uh, leverage as uh, in, in their homelands. Um, and uh, uh, maybe we could, uh, in, in terms of uh, this, maybe we could delve into the cultural angle a little more. Um, because as, as Ilya goes, spends quite a bit of time on, on culture. And mm -hmm. Jeff mentioned this. Uh, and so the first, the first half of the, the first part of the report focuses on that a great deal. So Louise has brought up kind of the, uh, the hard, hardest part of this, being we're not, we're not in soft power in terms of the corporate rating and everything that's going on. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, uh, we've seen the, uh, the, the, the naked national security threats that are in the papers every, every day. But the, the, what if we go back? Uh, so we have that as sort of one book. And what if we go to the most subtle parts of Ilya's paper, such as music. I mean, Ilya didn't talk about that in his presentation, so I'll hit maybe on a few of the, uh, the, the interesting and, uh, and uh, the sort of uh, what uh, Jeff referred to as the, uh, the gray, the ambiguous, uh, which are, in a way, the overriding theme of the first half of, of the report. Should we, should 
you want to talk about music then and, no. and some of the you know yeah, more it's subtle cultural things? Basically, it goes in, uh, along the lines that uh, Jeff mentioned that uh, uh, all uh, members of society are polluted and participating in some way or another in this uh, bigger culture of corruption. So I be, uh, what I argue is that Soviet legacy, uh, so, uh, this culture of uh, coercion and uh, being completely under the f foot of the state um, uh, had a lasting impact on society. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it atomized people completely, separated them from all different uh, um, affiliations, their own family, their ethnic clan, their cultural background, uh, their ancestors, their family history, their, um, uh, their traditions. And they only started to operate, uh, so it uh, ended up in uh, distrust of the whole uh, uh, notion of law, of uh, authority in general. Everyone sort of accepted, you know, double think, uh, double standards. And um, uh, this is not to say that, uh, uh, say, Russian society or post-Soviet society are completely incapable of democracy, uh, because I strongly believe that uh, in many ways, uh, there is now a coordinated, deliberate push from the elites and from the leaderships of the countries to impose more and more uh, non-liberal values uh, by, by force or by propaganda or by brainwashing. But uh, overall, in the society, there is this um, legacy, post-Soviet legacy, which is, uh, j just makes uh, society maybe not illiberal, but vulnerable, automized. Uh, so, this um, c culture of chanson, what I call, uh, it's uh, one of those um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, vi visual uh, sort of um, evid one of the evidence of that. Um, uh, basically, uh, the spread of uh, uh, this c uh, culture of uh, singing about um, you know, um, corrupt way of life, about uh, uh, criminal way of life, it's sort of accepted as a norm, and it's been elevated to highest levels. Um, and it, so I go into discussing one particular festival, which is essentially a musical festival in Russia called Silver Galosh, uh, Serebrina Kalosha, uh, which essentially praises and entertains around the idea of plagiarism, around chanson, about a uh, way of life of oligarchs. It's attended by oligarchs uh, every year. And so the epidemization of uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, unbelievable examples, to, to my taste, which is ex known in Russia and accepted in Russia, but hasn't been exposed enough here in the West. So um, two musical producers, uh, Igor Matvienko and uh, Max Fadiev, they uh, They've been caught plagiarizing uh, through that festival uh, about 10 times each. And then they ended up being the main musical producer for Sochi 2014 and Paralympics Sochi 2014. So the state itself elevated known plag plagiarists to the highest level. And they continue to be one of the main uh, musical producers in, in um, uh, on Russian TV, on federal channels, uh, in Russian f uh, musical festivals. Uh, but uh, also, like, every sixth uh, uh, State Duma uh, member has been caught uh, with a plagiarized thesis. So there is a whole market of uh, plagiarized um, uh, masters and doctors' d dissertations. Putin himself uh, has been caught by Fiona Hill and Cliff Geddy, but we also we uh, experts at Free Rush Foundation and our friends we have suspicions about uh, many others, including Igor Sechin. Uh, uh, so Jeff and Louise, do you want to perhaps comment on how this relates to corporate rating? Well, <laughs> Ilya, how how old fashioned of you, you know, using this word plagiarism, we call it hidden synergies and creative collaboration. <laughs> we're, we're in a globalized marketplace, we're interdependent. Why are you? <laughs> <He's>... <laughs> um, so so L Louise said at, uh, at a point in her remarks about the top law firms that 
if I heard you correctly, that the behavior is corrupt, if not outright criminal. And there again, we have these twin columns. You know, we need laws that are appropriate, that are adhered to and enforced. But then this other pillar, the corrupt part, which by implication may not be illegal, well, this is part of the cultural part, which I think is so difficult. So, so we, we understand a little bit better where Putin's comrades have come from and the universe in which they operate and their values set. But, but here, you know, I'd ask this question back to Louise and, of course, Ilya too, Charles. Um, <clears throat> Now, I'm going to sound old-fashioned, you know, top law firms, and you said these are not fringe units or, or companies. Um, you know, greed is not new. We've had that, you know, through human history in this country, and poor judgments and lack of wisdom. Uh, I'm just asking the question. It feels to me like in political culture, in popular culture, and in commercial culture. I can't prove it, I'm asking you. It feels to me like we have less in the way today of restraint and responsibility compared to previous periods. I can't prove it, but I'm asking. And, and you have to have rules and regulations, but even then, if you don't have the other pillar of restraint and responsibility, I say again, in political culture, in popular culture and in commercial culture, then you have, it's what we can get away with because no one can prove it was illegal. And that in and of itself is a big kind of decay. So I'd just be curious, both of you, but maybe Louise first to comment on that. I, I think in talking about this culture, there's a direct line between what Ilya's talking about of gulag culture and this legal nihilism, where, and where there was no respect for legal norms. And that's what you have in the chanson, and you also have in the culture of the narco corridos in Mexico that has helped f facilitate that environment. And it also existed in, in the smuggling cultures of pre-revolutionary France, where people didn't recognize the validity of an authoritarian state. They also had these. So what, what we're talking about is something that goes from, even before the gulag, of the, the legal nihilism that came in, with Lenin and then has become so pervasive through the culture. And it's then using that concept in, in wherever they are, in the lawyers that they're hiring, feeding them misinformation. And, and others. And so you go from something that is so institutionalized that it's just normalized. I, I completely agree. Uh, and um, oh, I think uh, actually both of the comments uh, bring together one of my main ideas, um, which I haven't yet conveyed, uh, and I hope I did in the paper. Uh, basically, during Cold War, uh, the, uh, the confrontation was organized uh, in, in, a, in a way where only the state really could act against other state. And uh, uh, you, uh, maybe, uh, arguably, Stalin and Andropov had more material resources at their, expand, at their uh, uh, availability. They could uh, uh, build more rockets, they could uh, have more tanks, they could maybe uh, help other states like Egypt uh, uh, with much bigger infrastru uh, infrastructure projects, but never in their wildest dreams did Stalin or Andropov uh, uh, hope to have a whole area of uh, wealthy people which they can deploy to the West under the guise of you know just private business. And they can go not necessarily into criminal activity in the West, but they can go into o open avenues and just use open channels in, of democracies in the West uh, and uh, do th uh, achieve political goals uh, and economic goals for themselves and for Putin uh, f uh, completely legally or um, partly legally, you know, or it, it's a gray area. So um, uh, I would say 70% of the activity described in this paper, uh, this kleptocratic uh, c corrosive um, uh, practices, they, they are not necessarily illegal. They are morally bankrupt. They could be shown to be, you know, unethical uh, or at least controversial. But 
uh, it's um, this red circle on uh, the page uh, 25. It's actually quite small. That's the only criminal, outright criminal already <coughs> covered by laws. Mm -hmm. That's why I think the orange and uh, uh, yellow areas uh, will grow more and more. Because mm -hmm. why do something illegal if you can um, uh, just buy influence or if you can, uh, you know, use open avenues? Um, but then gradually. Um, uh, impose your own uh, business practices and culture. Uh, y you make these lawyers at Previzon um, act in the way as, as if they are Russian lawyers. Uh, but you do it, uh, you spread it over time, uh, and you, you essentially train <laughs> these people to, way, to act in the way you want, you, you're used to, not the other way around. Yes. So that's why I start um, the whole paper with the notion that uh, in 1990s, the West hoped that uh, it will bring liberal values to to post-Soviet space, but it turns out that now with this, what's qualitatively different, and I'll finish with that, is that under Putin, uh, they started to have a lot of hard currency for uh, petrodollars, for mineral resources, and they could concentrate them uh, easily with no objections from the West in offshore accounts, in uh, Western jurisdictions, and uh, because there is no more Cold War, there is no more containment. Previously, Soviets, they could also sell oil, but they could not easily employ their money so, uh, in the West. They could just buy maybe food, they could buy Pepsi-Cola, they could exchange you know, uh, some uh, money for particular equipment, but that's it. Everything else was blocked. That's why, essentially, uh, this paper wants to show that we need a new policy of containment. We, we need to block this concentrated uh, hard currency wealth to go into open channels so easily in the West. All right. Well, uh, thanks. Um, we're going to go to David Kramer now, live from Florida. But I'd just like to insert one thought, which is not covered in Ilya's paper. Uh, in terms of non-state actors, and uh, uh, we, we're talking a lot about Russia, but this applies uh, more generally. But uh, these non-state actors, uh, people are scared of them also, and scared of violence and murder. I mean, that's something that isn't talked about a lot. Um, but in our in our greed and cowardice, we're scared of these people, and that's something that also needs to change. Uh, and, uh, and one thing Ilya talks about is the glamour of these huge yachts and this, that, and the other. Uh, and, uh, and we need to change our attitude and uh, uh, and not fear this anymore. Because I mean, the fact of the matter is they've been. If we look at it, they've been killing each other. They haven't started killing any of us yet. Uh, so there's no reason to be scared of them. They're, you know, let's, uh, let's at least have one, uh, one example of that. So David, are you there from uh, sunny Florida? Uh, I am, Charles, yes. You are. Now, I'm let's enjoying. see. We actually have you on the screen. OK. Yeah, scary terrific. <laughs> well, well, welcome. Uh, so, Greetings. Terrific. All right. Well, uh, uh, shoot. <laughs> well, Charles, thanks very much. And um, first, uh, thanks to you and everything you've done with the Kleptocracy Initiative and your great team there. And let me also join uh, Louise and Jeff in congratulating Ilya on this on this terrific and very timely paper. I remember some conversations with, with Ilya <clears throat> as this was uh, first being considered, and, and I'm really thrilled to see it out there. And uh, very, very pleased. Um, it, it's, it's a very important contribution. Let me just offer a few random, hopefully not completely incoherent thoughts um, on, on a few of the things that have been covered and things that in, in the paper. Um, it seems to me that there, there is a kind of, uh, they're, they're having their cake and eating it too, and by they I mean kleptocratic regimes. That is to say they are demonizing the West they are trying to discredit the West. They're trying to undermine our systems. They uh, view us, put us up as threats to their own grip on power. And while they're doing all of that, they're exploiting our systems. They stash the ill-gotten gains in our banking system. They buy real estate assets. They invest in shares and companies. Um, they send their sons, daughters, mistresses to study here, to vacation. So they are, they, these kleptocratic regimes and the people who benefit from this are having the best of both worlds. Uh, they are able to hold us up as a threat, which enables them to justify 
their means of governing and at the same time they're taking advantage of the very countries and systems that they are demonizing by exploiting our openness and our much more stable, reliable, and safer systems that will guarantee them some protection from what otherwise would be subject to the whims in their own country where the top leaders might decide the good days are over and it's time for those ill-gotten gains to be returned home. It seems that, as Ilya said in his opening comments, the corrosive effect on norms and practices is a very disturbing phenomenon. And we have to make sure that we don't accept the cheapening, the worsening, deteriorating in our norms and values. After all, the principles and values that we have stood for for so many years is what has differentiated us from the Soviet communist system, the Chinese communist system, the Cuban system, you name it. The list is a very lengthy one, unfortunately. And if we start lowering our standards and bringing them closer to the standards that they have put forward, then we will wind up doing more harm to ourselves, both in the long and short term. The other point I would raise is that, as Charles, something you mentioned in your opening comments about authoritarianism, kleptocracy, and corruption. The more corrupt these regimes become, the more authoritarian they become because they have to make sure that they deal with any possible threats to not only their grip on power, but their grip on assets. And so they want to snuff out any potential threats that they might see, whether threats from within their own borders or threats from outside their borders. And so it becomes this vicious circle where authoritarianism and kleptocracy and corruption go hand in hand and reinforce each other. And we need to see much stronger efforts on exposing the corruption and exposing the authoritarianism because in doing one, you'll actually be hitting both. And so I think it's very important that we focus on this circle, what I would argue is a serious threat. The non-state actors that Ilya has talked about are very much a part of this, and they become beholden to the regimes where they are allowed to engage in the kind of behavior and activity that they do. It helps the regimes, obviously, in maintaining their grip on power, but it also helps the pockets, the pocketbooks of these oligarchs and others who benefit from this kind of system. And so when Ilya was talking about what to do about this, and he was mentioning about containment, I obviously strongly agree with that. And we do need to tighten sanctions. The Global Magnitsky Act, which the Congress passed last year and President Obama signed into law, gives us the tool that we need to use very effectively, and hopefully the Trump administration and the State Department and the Treasury Department will make full use of this in going after the matter of corruption, corrupt activities, as well as gross human rights abuses. Again, these things go together, but much tougher sanctions. And if you start taking away the havens for people to stash their ill-gotten gains, then it's possible you would reduce the incentives to engage in this kind of corrupt kleptocratic activity. And once the kleptocracy starts eroding, then it's possible you can also start chipping away at the authoritarian grip that these regimes have. The ban on foreign funding of political parties, and Ilya talks about this with the political donations in his report, the United States has the right system on this, perhaps needs to make sure it's fully enforced. But in France, as we all know, and mentions this in the report, Marine Le Pen was very proud of taking Russian money. That should be a source of shame and embarrassment, not a source of pride. And so that needs to be fixed in other countries. Full transparency, Ilya talked about this in real estate. 
on page 35, there's been some progress on the title insurance issues, but we need to make sure that there's much greater transparency and sourcing of funds that come here. This also includes a purchase of media companies or sports teams or shares, significant shares in some of our major companies, including the social media sector, which is an issue that is obviously front and center these days. Last point is about the celebrities, and Jeff mentioned this, and there's a brief mention about it here in the report, is people like Steven Seagal and others and singers and actors who show up for birthday parties of people like Ramzan Kadyrov, go to Kazakhstan, you name it. We need to return a sense of shame, a sense of embarrassment, that it is not okay for people to lend their fame to enhance their own fortune by boosting the legitimacy and the image of these kleptocratic authoritarian leaders. So that requires more exposure. It requires more investment in journalism, investigative journalism, and it requires vigilance on our part to make sure that people who engage in the enablers, as has been mentioned already, that those people are exposed and to make sure that they understand it's not okay. So thanks again. I'm sorry I'm not there with you in person, though I'm not sorry I'm in Miami. And again, congratulations, Ilya, on the report, and thanks for having me. Thank you, David. Well, we will now move into the second panel. So Jeff and Louise, thank you very much, and we'll welcome Sarah Chase, Ambassador Richard Kozlerich, and Paul Massaro of the Helsinki Commission. So please join us on the stage, and we'll go in the order as indicated on the program. So once we get settled in, I'm sure Sarah has things to say. And so I guess if each of you can sort of limit it to about six minutes, we'll have a little time to converse after. Yeah, I want to hear what they have to say. Will there be a section for audience questions? Well, Rachel, we have a fairly small audience, so what I would suggest is that we have to stop at 11.30. We've had a much more packed, intensive program than we usually do for report launches and all of that. So we've got a lot of performance sort of up here. So what I'd suggest, we'll all be here. Too many of us. Well, I mean, this is all, this is being videoed, and Hudson, we do an incredible job here, and thank you, Noam, of preserving these events. So we're really creating a video document as much as a live event, and people watch this stuff after the fact. And so that's really what we're trying to do here, and you're like the studio audience to some extent. So thank you for coming. But we'll all be around at 11.30, so what I'd suggest is at that point we can all field questions and split off into many groups and whatever at that point, and people can stay a little bit depending on how much time they have. So Sarah, please. I actually had a question, which you don't have to answer, which is to you, actually, and you don't need to answer it now. But I'm just interested in, you mentioned that this report initially had a lot more names and a lot more detail. And so I'd be interested in hearing it, you know, at some point about what the process is that, frankly, you know, sanitizes it a little bit and what the considerations were. Sure, I'd be happy to. Because all of us are under this type of pressure who are working on this topic. Absolutely. Well, the answer is brief, as I'm sure you can imagine. I mean, U.K. libel law is mentioned in the report. That is the problem. But aren't you a U.S. publisher? Well, that's not true. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's publishing here, but that doesn't that doesn't matter. I mean, there's been the 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 law, the Rachel Ehrenfeld improvement in terms of blocking us from the encroachments of UK libel law, but that's that's an issue that's out there. And then, obviously, when a lot of the things we talk about are are quite sensitive, once you start naming names and all that. The other thing is, if we named a lot of names and made this into an investigative journalism kind of thing. That's different, because then you're not focusing on the concepts. 
And so there's also that aspect uh, yeah. to it. So and we wanted I, to really make it you concept. Know, and I go, I've got the same sort of issues working yeah. on the same right. uh, types of topics. Yeah. But I think we all who work in this field need to think about this and think about the degree to which we're going to let ourselves get intimidated out of um, saying stuff that really matters. And how do you get the right balance between real hard details and concepts. I agree with you that too often investigative stories kind of go down rabbit holes and it seems to be one story about one particular issue and, and everyone's eyes glaze over, including ours. Um, so you do want to keep the focus on concepts as well. But I think, you know, there's a danger, too, in, in over-sanitizing to where it seems so general that it almost doesn't, you know, and, 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 and that also is a kind of in, image laundering in a way when things right. are... Well, I, so. think, I think in a way, you know, in the current context, there's been so much in the newspapers for the last right. six months, especially the last two months, big crescendo, and not only Russia but China, that everybody here can sort of fill in the blanks in terms of that. A year, a year ago, it would have been very different. Right. Right. I think I think now the filling in the blanks is, is something everyone can do. So I just wanted to make two points, very not six minutes. Um, one is, from the perspective of people who have worked on and in the former Soviet Union, um, I think this looks like a specialized phenomenon that emanates from this part of the world. And so, and while I agree a hundred percent that there is some active exporting of these norms and practices. What I'm looking at is an absolutely global phenomenon um, that looks exactly like this. And so the overlay of public and private sectors, the use of all of the types of offshoring, et cetera, et cetera, the switch from a government that was obliged to provide a certain degree of public services to its citizens. That was the basis of its legitimacy, to absolute bare faith maximizing of revenues for network members. I see it now. Some of the countries I've looked at have been infected, if you will, by some of the former Soviet Union types, like in Central America, for example. But a lot of countries that I've looked at have not at all. And so I actually think in a funny way, in spite of the specifics that you're providing about the gulag culture, I actually feel like former Soviet Union is part of a global zeitgeist. And, zeitgeist, and I would like to switch to some extent, um, this is really the second point, the notion that the US with its pristine you know, integrity and stuff like that is being infected by these former Soviet Union practices and norms, we were part of changing this zeitgeist because we were the ones that said collective investment of resources for collective well-being is evil and it's communist and it's terrible and therefore we need to privatize everything and we need to... So the cultural thing that you're talking about is also, um, frankly, the glorification of money the glorification of the private amassing of wealth, at least under the Soviet Union, as you suggest, there was a kind of shame, as you, you, know, as you suggest. You couldn't quite flaunt it. And when you look at some of the formerly, I mean, take Egypt, where you had, under Mubarak, two kleptocratic networks. You had the military kleptocratic network, and you had the crony capitalist kleptocratic network around Mubarak's son, Gamal. Interestingly, the revolution was against the second the military basically sat back, allowed the population to kill the crony capitalist network, and then stepped back in and expanded itself to owning the entire political economy. Why wasn't the population enraged at the military, cr cr uh, military network? Because it functioned in largely the Soviet way. It, 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 you, it gave usufruct of the benefits. You got to go to hotel, fancy hotels. You got great food. You got a driver. You got good education for your kids. But you didn't have personally owned Ferraris and Rolexes you know, uh, that you were brandishing all over the place. And so, and you apparently provided <coughs> a degree of service to the population. You looked, you know. And so I actually think our cultural issue here is even deeper. It's, it's exactly what you're getting at, but it's really deep. And it's about, I mean, we've gotten confused about the private market or uh, the free market 
and the glorification of any profit that is obtained by any means by an apparently private entity. That we've gone overboard in, I think, glorifying that type of a norm. Thank you, sir. Richard? Well, thanks very much. Thanks, Charles, thanks, really, for a great, great paper. Um, I'm kind of wondering why I'm here on this panel, other than my past association with Azerbaijan, which gives me a certain perspective on all of these topics. But um, a couple of things struck me as I, I read the paper, and I, I, I think I agree. This is a, a global issue now. It's not just, I mean, you've, you've effectively described the principles that apply, but they are not just principles from from the former uh, Soviet Union. Um, I remember when I was ambassador in Bosnia and gave a speech uh, warning about the dangers of corruption in, in Bosnia. Uh, the late President Ilya Itzbegovic uh, the next day went uh, before the media and said, well, the American ambassador doesn't know what he's talking about. You can't find swimming pools behind the houses of, of uh, my ministers and all. And th the idea that we look <laughs> for something close to home that's very physical as an evidence of, of this phenomena, phenomena has changed radically. And I think that's an important point that, that you made in the paper. The thing that I'm struck, struck at in all of this is the second generation of corruption. Um, when I was in Azerbaijan, I mean, one would not accuse Haider Aliyev of not being a corrupt <laughs> leader. I mean, that was um, you know, part of his persona even during this, the Soviet period. But it was a very, very controlled process. I mean, people weren't really allowed to flaunt exactly. flaunt the, exactly. the benefits that they were receiving. Right. It, was, it was done with, with a certain set of, uh, as David talked about, uh, discipline and responsibility. But now the second generation, I mean, you look at the way these people behave, Lamborghinis on the streets. Of, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, selfies on private jets and yachts with absolutely no concept of how this, what, what, this, what this does, even to, for regime survivability. And I think we really need to look at it in terms of, you know, it's Araz and Amin Akalarov and look at how their different behaviors are, are playing out, or Zia and Anar Mamyadov again. That second generation, which is even more dangerous, I think, uh, and, and this is my, my last point, this is a national security problem for the United States. I, you've written on that, so I'm, <laughs> but, uh, but we have to recognize this for what it is, and, and you're dealing, uh, in some cases, with people who, who aren't capable of using the access that they have to wealth uh, in, a, in a way that, you know, you can count on, on them behaving in, in a responsible way. Um, you've got, I think, the, the whole question of what's to be done. Uh, I, I really think we have to work more on the disclosure and transparency part. Um, you know, when, when people write op-ed pieces, they ought to declare, you know, who they're receiving money from when they when they write these pieces. I, I think think tanks need to be thinking about codes of conduct. Um, you know, adopting a code of conduct about who they receive money from, how they're going to disclose, disclose this. And, and I really think, and particularly in the case of Azerbaijan, um, when you see this behavior going on in ways that are counterproductive in a region that's important for the United States, we really do need to think about applying sanctions whether they're financial sanctions on specific government officials or travel sanctions on people who may be involved in you know, breaking, uh, breaking our own sanctions on Iran and North Korea and other places. Uh, we, we really have to move more, more aggressively. I, I hate to do this, but in this case, who's we? The President of the United States was in business with <laughs> the very people that you're talking essentially about sanctioning. So, so again, here we are a bunch of think tankers who are used to trying to apply, apply leverage on largely the executive branch, but also the, the legislative branch. We're in a whole new world right now. I That's mean, maybe right. we need to talk about social sanctions. Maybe we need to talk about how do we get the public into this fight? Because 
this executive branch is not going to sanction the business well, I, partners of, right? Well, all, all I can say is the previous administration wasn't about to sanction them either for no. quite different reasons. So right. it's a, it's, this, is, this is a bipartisan challenge. Definitely. It sure is. Right. It most but certainly it, is. And it's very international. I mean, if we look at the, at the situation of France, where traditionally, since there was no system for the financing of political parties, they, they created this system, which both left and right used absolutely. of African, African kleptocracies being the way funds were funneled to the, yeah. into the political system. So, I mean, this is, we've had a long crescendo into our current uh, dilemma. So, uh, Paul, are you going to uh, solve all of this for us, Rhett? Well, I might have a few ideas. Pull it all together? Yeah, so I'm here not as a think tanker, actually. I'm here as a representative of the uh, Helsinki Commission staff. Uh, I, in true Hill fashion, have a prepared statement that I will read. Um, but, you know, let me, let me start the same way the, the statement starts by saying, you know, thanks very much for the work that the Hudson Institute is doing, and thank you, Charles, thank you, Ilya. Uh, you know, I think this paper is an extremely important piece uh, of the work that we're engaged in, the work that the staff is engaged in, the work that the commissioners are engaged in, and I think that this narrative is really taking root in a big way on the Hill. Um, let me also say that I agree with Sarah in that this is a global phenomenon. I think that the way this is divided in academia and on the Hill is by region. Mm -hmm. And we're always going to be looking at this by region. Uh, my mandate is not to look at anything outside of the OSC region. So I will not address anything outside of the OSC region uh, for fear of jurisdictional issues, correct? Um, but that's, that's the way we, we're, we're divided. So I think that it's a, it's a definite question how we can build communication networks, how we can, between committees, let's say, subcommittees, whatever, between academia, in order, in, in order to develop an interdisciplinary, interregional approach to this phenomenon, because it really is not just limited to the former Soviet sphere. Although, you know, Ilya, you and I, we focus on the former Soviet sphere, right? So, um, so I'll start with a statement. Uh, kleptocracy is the gravest transnational threat that Western states face. It encourages and empowers authoritarian governance while undermining the rule of law and democratic institutions. Unchallenged, kleptocratic behavior becomes the modus operandi of government, subverting democracy and co-opting vast tracts of society into its institutionalized corruption scheme. Kleptocracy also imperils the security and prosperity of our allies. Kleptocratic behavior both entrenches oppressive governance in authoritarian states and sows the seeds of anti-democratic values in the West. Kleptocrats infiltrate and exploit our institutions and encourage illegal and illiberal activity among our elites and civil society leaders, undercutting the foundations of our democracy. And as we've emphasized many times, sometimes that is very willingly done. Um, kleptocracy has entrenched itself nowhere in the OSE region more than Russia. The Russian government engages in kleptocratic activity in order to stifle democracy and sustain its domestic authority. The Kremlin governs undemocratically, suppresses free commerce and stymies political transparency by stealing and hiding the assets of the Russian people through an opaque network of agents. Russian kleptocracy reinforces its authoritarian system and leaves its, its citizens with no possible recourse to contest it. Criminals, cronies, and the state have established a system that relies on secrecy and intimidation to maintain and grow their own authority and profits. All of these elements disdain everyday law-abiding citizens and jointly strive to suppress dissent. Kleptocrats view people as objects to be bought or eliminated. They only view themselves, their inner circle, as having the right to free choice and protection, as Ilya emphasizes many times in his report. Considered together, these facts have contributed to create a culture of criminality that has become idealized through the popular culture of kleptocratic states. Their lifestyle, behavior, and power is illustrative of this pervasive and damaging reality. As a consequence, citizens of kleptocratic states often see no other alternative to this ubiquitous system of corruption and are forced to accept it. Alone, nations cannot challenge kleptocracy given the enormity and extent of the threat. We must work cooperatively and inter interdisciplinarily uh, and involve international institutions in this endeavor. The OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, with which the Helsinki Commission works very closely. The world's largest regional security organization upholds democratic values, enshrines the sovereignty of its participating states, and promotes human rights. The agreements reached by participating states, including the founding Helsinki Final Act, ordained the OSCE to safeguard the post-Cold War order 
that is marked by economic freedom, political transparency, and participatory democracy. Kleptocracy and other corrupt practices jeopardize democratic stability in the OSCE region. Without question, opposing corruption and kleptocracy is central to the OSCE's founding mission, especially when it emanates from one of its signatory members. Over the past few years, the OSCE has paid greater attention to the scourge of corruption in participating states and outlined strategies to promote good governance and eliminate corruption and other kleptocratic activities. In this regard, the Dublin and Basel declarations, finalized in 2012 and 2014 at ministerial councils, are excellent examples. Both agreements promote domestic reforms targeting political transparency initiatives in tandem with more concerted uh, anti-corruption efforts. They also advocate for OSCE participating states to strengthen multi-stakeholder cooperation between the public and private sectors. The OSCE seeks to encourage a greater role for private firms, and I think this really comes back to what Jeff was saying earlier about restraint and responsibility for private firms to take a role in this, um, in identifying and combating blatant corruption. In order for the United States and its allies to extinguish kleptocracy in Europe, adherence to these agreements, core OSCE practices, and participation in future summits will be critically important. The Helsinki Commission, uh, our organization, too, is concerned by the rise and spread of kleptocracy and is strongly committed to combating it. The Helsinki Commission is an independent commission of the US Congress, established in 1976 and led by nine senators, nine representatives, and three appointees from the executive branch. It is mandated to monitor the compliance of participating states with the consensus-based commitments of the OSCE. Since July, the commission has held a hearing on combating kleptocracy with incorporation transparency, held briefings concerning the recovery of stolen assets at which actually at both the hearing and the briefing we had Charles uh, on the panel, uh, combating energy sector corruption and the extent of Kremlin ties to, the, to corruption, and published multiple online pieces addressing the subject. On the Hill, we have become the primary forum for discussion of the topic. We will continue to work to expose the severity of kleptocratic practice to ensure that the United States is able to counter corrupt kleptocracy in all its forms. As a result of our public engagement on this issue, we have already cultivated important relationships on Capitol Hill and elsewhere, building a network of committed policymakers and experts that offers fresh insights and new tactics to combat kleptocracy and reverts its deleterious influence. Today's event is part of this process, and I encourage all stakeholders, like everybody in the audience, my door is always open. Please reach out to me. I really want to speak with every single one of you. A lot of you I have spoken with. Uh, this is huge for me also because, unlike everybody else on this panel, I will acknowledge I am relatively newer to the field. <laughs> um, so it's extremely helpful. Um, only through collaboration can we successfully repel kleptocracy and the authoritarianism it engenders. Commissioners have been hard at work to tackle global corruption. Commissioner Senator Sheldon Whitehouse introduced the True Incorporation Transparency for Law Enforcement Act. It has been looked at in a few Congresses to uh, you know, create true beneficial ownership transparency in the United States, which would establish incorporation transparency such that anonymous shell companies cannot be abused by kleptocrats to launder their ill-gotten gains in the United States. Commissioner Senator Marco Rubio introduced the Corporate Transparency Act, along with Senator Ron Wyden, which would do the same through a different mechanism. Uh, the Commission's co-chairman, Representative Chris Smith, and Commissioner Representative Gwen Moore are co-sponsors of the House version of this bill. Ranking Senate Commissioner, uh, Senate Senator Ben Cardin, introduced the Combating Global Corruption Act, uh, which envisions a tiered system of countries based off their level of corruption and efforts to fight said corruption. And this would result in a sort of sanctioning, uh, as you spoke about, Ambassador. Um, Commissioner Rubio has co-sponsored this legislation. Uh, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but only a few examples of the ways that commissioners are engaging. Obviously, they're also speaking on this, letters, all sorts of stuff uh, outside the legislative process. Uh, ultimately, combating kleptocracy is more than a question of merely upholding the law and enforcing the free operation of public institutions. It is an ideological conflict between corruption and the rule of law. And one thing that's not in the same that I'll add is Brian Whitmore on the panel, whose corruption is the new communism, is... Such a beautiful thing. I just love to bring that up anytime I can. Um, kleptocratic regimes promote and export values that are inimical to our own. This systematic challenge to participatory democracy and the rule of law cannot be ignored. Um, as Ilya notes in his research, the Kremlin has imparted corrosive and illiberal values through its extensive kleptocratic campaign, encouraging its vast network of cronies, lawyers, and other prominent public figures to undermine our public institutions and profit from it. 
His latest paper succinctly outlines the weaponization of corruption and is a tremendous contribution to the field. We must recognize this ideological threat, how it operates, and what we can do about it. Kleptocracy is the key challenge of the 21st century, and we must be prepared to face it. And that ends the prepared statement. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you have anything else you'd like to add, Paul? Well, I, I, sort of, I sort of added my thoughts at the beginning. I just say that yeah. you know, these panels have been fantastic. Uh, you know, your, your insights have already given me a lot of ideas of what needs to come next. Um, and you know, we're in a phase right now at the Helsinki Commission where we have an opportunity to do a lot of good, I think. So I'd really encourage people to reach out. You know, once again, uh, we're looking for ideas. The door is open. Um, and that's it. Okay. Well, I think just to supplement what, what Paul mentioned uh, and, and the work he's doing in the Helsinki Commission is hugely supportive of a lot of uh, legislation that's either known and out there, such as the bills in the House and the Senate on anonymous companies or so-called beneficial ownership legislation. But there's a plethora of other stuff going on uh, on the Hill and, and bills being put together to push back against the sorts of things we've been talking about today and that Ilya in particular addresses in his paper, that is the corrosive effects of authoritarian kleptocracy on, uh, on our society. Yes, if I, if I may add, much like Ilya had to take some names out of his report, I'd take some bills out of my statement so as not to keep <laughs> you here all day, but there's a lot of work yeah. being done. A lot, a, lot, a lot of things going on, so I think that's very heartening. Now, we have six minutes left. Ilya, would you like to say a few uh, closing things? And Sarah, Richard, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, and then I hope you will stay uh, for a little bit after 11.30 in terms of questions and anything that you'd like to engage uh, us, uh, us on. Ilya? I'd love to add uh, to oh, these been brilliant comments and uh, in, bullet, uh, in bullet points, really, to try to try to stay concise. Um, I uh, completely agree with uh, Sarah's uh, you know, uh, emphasis that we, we should uh, uh, look at this problem of uh, essentially um, um, self-censorship and, and fear of uh, think tanks and universities and experts to talk about this. And, uh, but I would add journalists as well mm. and uh, um, uh, policy makers, uh, officials. Um, uh, precisely because we're talking about gray areas, be because we're no longer in Cold War. Uh, and um, I would um, uh, actually, uh, uh, the, 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 the way we met with Sarah is I saw her reports and how many names she actually managed to put in and how many individual cases. So I highly recommend to look uh, at uh, her studies of, uh, uh, I, I saw some Azerbaijani Russian names which were, and other specific enablers of those regimes, which I haven't seen anywhere else. Uh, at the same time, I would say um, uh, we can't be heroes, we can't uh, uh, fight uh, huge machines without backing, uh, that's why we need to organize ourselves. Uh, it's, there is always a danger uh, that uh, if you fail in one of those cases mm. and you're taken to court and proven by these very uh, expert uh, professional lawyers that you are uh, you know, engaging in libel, then your reputation is ruined. And as an expert, you are no longer effective. So even in terms of, uh, it's not even a question of bravery, it's a question of uh, strategy. strategy and fighting back. And so, I mean, one of my strategies was to um, give about uh, 50, several dozen examples to, uh, and cases to Charles and Nate, and uh, they had to fight back and scale it down. But still, I can say I successfully, together with brilliant work of uh, Nate, uh, editorial work, we got many, many examples. So I'm still proud that we have quite a few examples here, uh, but they're bulletproof. And we 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 confident in, in those examples and in responsible sources that we use. Um, but on the question of, um, I completely agree. This is not uh, um, uh, about uh, uh, muddy hands from post-Soviet uh, Union going after white angel of Western democracies, uh, and it's a global phenomenon. It's all mixed up. I mean, um, when I stood uh, in front of Russian embassy uh, with the weirdest possible uh, poster uh, during uh, Russian protests uh, in 2012. It said, uh, the West underestimates Kremlin's drive for global corruption. 
which is a, a weird uh, long poster. But you, you know the response I got from uh, my uh, American friends in New York? The, 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 the most common response, well, we got our own oligarchs. We got our own corruption. So um, oh, while I agree, I call it, and we had this discussion at the Helsinki Commission, I called it a G7 versus G13 phenomenon, where, uh, where these not-so-ideal democracies and uh, so who always suffered from their own corruption are fighting even worse corruption um, and uh, it's really now ideological with, because we're talking about sophisticated attempt to bring crony capitalism from those countries and uh, to use existing crony capitalism in the West. But I would still not put any, and you're not doing it, I, uh, uh, but I would avoid Russia today uh, kind of propaganda when they put moral equivalency between all corruption. And they, uh, we still in the West have uh, rule of law and uh, we still, I mean, the difference between Berlusconi's Italy and uh, Ali's Azerbaijan is that Berlusconi eventually went out of power. <laughs> however bad it is, however corrupt Italy remains, uh, still there is some result from uh, uh, some kind of rule of law, some shaming, some media freedom. Uh, and also I uh, still argue, and this is, I agree this is debatable, and um, I still believe, and we had these debates at Helsinki Commission, at NAD, at um, think tanks. Uh, there is uh, something exceptional about China and Russia in particular. Just their scale, their ability to use secret services, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the whole scale of their organized crime, and they moved from trying to... Uh, to uh, weaponize cryptocracy in their, among their neighbors to uh, really global ambitions um, w with w very wide-reaching uh, um, impact. And um, uh, Richard asked why, uh, why you are here. I think... Uh, <laughs> that <laughs> well, <I> was brilliant. Because I really followed uh, Richard's uh, blogs and the uh, articles he writes. Uh, he, uh, the w it's an absolutely amazing example how such relatively small country like Azerbaijan with this concentrated wealth managed to weaponize its uh, kleptocratic influence so it essentially brought down uh, Council of Europe mm. its effective, uh, effectiveness of uh, the body in Europe which is supposed to look after human rights and corruption mm. this small country not single handedly but was the leader to uh, really put down this major uh, Western institution. That's three billion euros. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's, uh, yeah, but that, that's that's actually pretty cheap it for is. what they achieved. I mean, Paul has a comment, but I'd just like to say on the on the Azerbaijan versus uh, Italy issue. I mean, there is a very very important fundamental difference. In Italy, there is freedom. As Azerbaijan, there is not. And that I think freedom is a is an element in this whole discussion that we've left out a little bit. But everybody's yeah. talking about democracy, blah blah blah. But what about freedom? This is a somewhat different concept, and uh, I think one we need to focus on more when we think about the uh, threats of um, authoritarian kleptocracy. Now, Paul has a brief comment, and then we're done, and we hope you'll stick around, though, to, uh, to, uh, to, to discuss things with people. Uh, well, I didn't mean to take the closing word, but I, I did, no, I, I did want to <laughs> add, just, just real quick, we've emphasized a lot today that we're not a white angel, and that you know we're complicit in this, and we have you know all these sorts of problems that have you know, led to this that and, and that we've we've been a part of. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that, you know, we have the democratic institutions and the rule of law. You know, we need to have more confidence in who we are. Um, I'm, I see a lot of cynicism around. I think there's a lot of cynicism in my generation, for instance, um, with regard to our institutions and, oh, democracy is a scam anyway. And that's that plays into these the, the hands of these people. You know, I, I think it's I think it's really worth our time every now and then to sit back and think, Oh, yeah, we did a pretty good job, you know? Let's uh, protect it. Uh, let's, yeah, let's right, protect let's protect it. it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 25 seconds. Yeah. Uh, in all this, we should recall the battle cry of Paris 68. Be realistic. Demand the impossible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ilya, thank you. <laughs>